Greetings, programs. Hanker and Fernale here with another episode of Drunken Drunkens and Dragons. draw the line between humorous nonsense as a breaking down of the normal social barriers which prevent us from opening our imagination to possibilities, and where do you get into the actual content, assuming an already open imagination? <laughs> oh, the questions. Hmm. Oh, the answers. Greetings, programs. Hanker and Fernale here with another episode, Drunkens and Dragons. How to play D&D, you know how, just like a big old badass. That's you, that's me, this is D&D right here, so let's jump right in. You guys know about the series about three encounters to start your campaign. Well, it's flown wildly out of control. This is the sixth room in that series, which I'm not really trying to give you what you need to run your campaign, but what I want to do is show you the specifics and the silly arbitrary certainty that can come together into a symphony of adventure and epicry that will form what will later be referred to in stories as a campaign. Low fantasy. Low fantasy is easy to DM because the stats are small, the progression is low, you don't want a ton of magic, your themes stay simple and very real, very natural, and this next room is a classic exercise in playing around with the concepts in low fantasy, which are things are natural and real. Now, if you remember the, uh, the setup for this adventure, our last uh, sort of wandering into the world of low fantasy um, was the road to Westburg, where we had some poor adventurers who have no money, who are forced to work as wagon escorts, which is how uh, Fandelver also opens, which is that your meager wa wagon escort move through the mountains to make sure that shipments reach their destinations. You're basically a FedEx driver of the fantasy world, which is a noble charge, to be fair, but not exactly high fantasy. Things that may seem wild and out there are in fact explainable in a natural fashion, and that's what's going to continue to ground your low fantasy campaign. Mm. That, and a cruel insistence on poverty. You have to be stingy with your treasure and gold in a low fantasy campaign to keep it low. Room two of low fantasy in room design entitled The Deadly Detour. <laughs> Continue on the road after your harrowing ordeal at Shadow Crags, only to find the road completely blocked by a small landslide of boulders and broken trees. There is a way to go around, but it's a barely trodden footpath. As you commence moving your way around this footpath, struggling to get the wagon over this smaller space that has barely been cleared by other travelers, a poor wretch comes running out of the rocks. Don't go this way, great beast of Taldak. He awaits in the rocks beyond this path. Turn back now. Ah! The guy just runs for his life. Now, if the players try to subdue or restrain this poor wretch, they can get a little more information out of him, that he had a party of four travelers, three of them were killed up ahead by the Beast of Taldak. History or lore checks will reveal that Taldak actually is a known creature to dwell in these mountains that's been told of for about two generations, sort of a Sasquatch-like creature. Some people aren't so sure he's real, but others swear that they have seen the broken, mutilated bodies at his cavernous entrance, like cavernous lair entrance. <laughs> wow. Getting A plus on oration today. Nice. So that's your setup. 
The players face this detour around a landslide and they have to go through a less developed area of jagged rocks. The only purpose of the nameless poor wretch is to inform you, good God, things are about to happen and run away. Don't get involved with this guy. Don't give him a name and a history. It doesn't matter. Just get him the hell out of the story. He's just a quick little setup so that we can get into the room without a bunch of confusion and maybe we'll go this way, maybe we'll go that No, no, you don't get any of those choices. We're going this way, it's the only way to go. We're moving forward and actually once that poor wretch makes such a loud racket, the, the, the encounter is basically joined. It's time to begin. So, let's get into it, the deadly detour. Here's the board right here. Um, as you can see, normal forestry board with some rocks mixed in and then we have this sort of whoa what is this stuff going on again for the sake of the channel for the sake of the video I'm not gonna worry a lot about fog of war so if you wanted to uh, reveal a little less of this room so that your players get some revelation as they come around the bend because as you can see this is another S turn board very familiar if you guys watch my room design series when you put an S turn on your board you get triple the space all packed into one little board so it doesn't wind up just being two moves to cross this is a good four to five moves to move all this distance gives your board a lot more time a lot more traversal and that's going to be more chances for you and your monsters to do interesting things and delay movement assuming as you almost always do that the player's main goal is to exit the far side of the board or route the enemies loot them and then exit the far side of the board that's what a lot of this gameplay adds up to we enter right here we have helm and stills and zymer all with their wagon and their little crate of supplies which they still don't know what it is it bears a royal seal seal but they have no idea why lowly adventurers like them would be escorting a royal cargo it makes no sense but who knows? Who knows what lies ahead in the story? And if you guys know my storytelling technique, I have no idea what lies ahead in the story. I have not written why this is a mysterious royal crate. It's just good foreshadowing and I'll let the players help me figure out what that really means and plan it session by session. Instead of racking my brain trying to come up with this masterful interweaving multi-arc story that's going to blow everyone's mind. Enter with their wagon. They've got some rock formations and it begins. Now notice we have a DC 11 on our hands here. These are low level characters. Very easy room. One of the things that I want to show you with the deadly detour is that sometimes ease can be a great way to get a lot of play done. So if you're low level it can be really fun to dispatch lots of enemies and succeed at lots of roles to get into the game. A big mistake would be at low level to introduce them to a huge damage sponge type monster that just takes all this slogging combat to defeat because you don't get any little successes. So my concept here with the Deadly Detour is let's just load these new players up with small successes. Just tons of little wins that are gonna make them fall in love with the game and with your group and with each other. And it's just, love, it's just gonna be a love it. It's just gonna be panamorous, right? So. Woo! There's the setup. So they enter right here. What is the timer, the, three, the threat, and the treat for this board? Always your first question as a DM when you're doing your little, you know, third of a page of preparation. The timer we're going to introduce right away, and it's a sort of an optional timer. So let's get right into that. They enter here. Now, as you can see in the layout, boo! Here's your wagon. Here's our three characters. And there's a little rocky enclave right here. Now, this you'll see this in the close-ups. There's some little supply crates inside this little rocky enclave and a supply crate right outside of it here to kind of lead them in. So, let's imagine that Helm is at the front, at the helm, if you will, of the group. Notices this little rocky enclave. And I can almost guarantee you players love looking inside these little things when they see little prop crates like this. They know they're going to find goodies. So let him search that one. He goes inside here and searches this other crate. Your description or flavor text for these crates is that they're very old and dilapidated and have been here for far too long. The goods inside are barely salvageable, but again, go to your 1D4, you know, is it gear, food, a spell, or a potion type thing. And, and, but keep it really low. They get, you know, maybe a dagger out of this thing, maybe a 1D4 bandage kit, like very low. The rest is kind of covered in spider webs and dust. And actually, as Helm is rummaging through these crates in this little rocky enclave, 
that's when we're gonna introduce our timer. And that's what's so fun. This is a player triggered timer. So you can do player triggered timers by giving away their location, by stepping on a trap or a pressure plate, or a lot of different ways. But in this particular case, this crate inside this little rocky enclave is infested with bees and wasps and other stinging insects of ill repute. So they instantly burst out and you've got your nice little pathfinder wasp or mosquito or giant bee pawns ready to go and pow, we've got our timer. How does the timer work with the bees? Every timer, the bees are going to sort of swarm and catch up to the players. So right now they're just flying around. If you've ever encountered like a, a, a beehive problem, there is a moment there when you can flee for your life and they're a little confused and they're moving around and that's what this timer is gonna represent. So if they get a four, they're living pretty, pretty leisurely. If they get a one, it's getting real fast. Oh, and it is indeed a one. I tell you this homemade D4 is evil. So they come up, they swarm, they instantly identify Helm as the disturber of their nest and in one round are gonna hit him. Roll initiative, Pa! The board is on. So, oh God, tries to squeeze out of this enclave, only then realizing this is a total trap. The entrance to this enclave is so narrow that it is tapered in one direction. So to go in is relatively easy, but to get out, it, your armor gets all hung and it's gonna require a strength check. So, Helm rolls his strength check on DC 11, he gets the win. So he escapes the little enclave. Otherwise he would have been in there with the bees. There you go, you get your first easy small scale win. Did he escape the bees? Not really, but at least he didn't get trapped with them. Then he gets a half move and he's about out here. Stills is like, we gotta keep this wagon moving. If we leave it behind, we'll never get back. So Stills needs to make a strength check to roll the wagon up this far, makes the check, sees the bees to his left and is just like, oh shit, bees. Zymer comes up here casts, well, what, what would a first or second level wizard have that he could use here? He's definitely not going to have wall of force or globe of invulnerability or any of that kind of stuff. So I think Zymer comes up and tries to kick these supplies in the way of the bees to slow them down, but they're all just flying over everything. A noble effort, Zymer, but didn't really do any good. And that's everybody's turn, so here come the bees. They swarm, and by the layout of the players, it looks like Zymer and Helm are both subject to the damage that the bees are gonna do. They're stung. They take 1d4 damage, da -da. they each take three damage. That is a lot of bee stings, like this is hell. Then the bees have to regroup with another timer. This time, a four. So the bees attack, several of them die because their stingers are buried in Zymer's butt, and they all start you know, swirling and moving around, and it's gonna be four rounds before the bees really catch up to it again. Remember, three damage at this level is terrible, and bees are immune to weapon damage, so you cannot hack and slash these things. You need to use fire, smoke, or magic to get rid of them. So these guys have very few of any one of those three things. So we're back to player turn. Stills is like, we gotta hurry through this place, and he runs up, begins to get a better look at what they're up against. The group keeps up, the bees are swirling, they count down one, we move forward, they manage to get the Wagon around this tight bend, perhaps even with a strength check, if you want to keep the strength checks rolling. And at that moment, now we get into the real threat of the board, which is the archers of Taldak. So if you remember, Taldak is this notorious, maybe real, maybe not monster that has been haunting this area of the mountains for many, many years. Some people believe in, some don't. Either way, there's a legion of scrabbly archers, more goblinoids, mountain people, sort of, you know, trappers and rat-like men who pop up out of the rocks up ahead. Now I'm just using these sort of little archer pawns. And you, if you want to roll for how many there are, here's a 1d6, so two, I've placed two, there you go. So if you can get a closer look here, there are small pieces of a crenellated cover in the rocks. Crenellations being small slotted formations that allow an archer to lean through a slot and fire and be relatively covered. Okay, so whoa, you are about to introduce low level players to cover combat and ranged combat. So far I don't think you've done anything with real bow and arrow play. 
Their positioning is horrible right now. These archers have the drop on them. They take two shots, both with advantage. They do some damage to stills. They do some damage to helm. It looks like Zymer is covered by rock formations. And we come around, the bees count down to three. Um, and then we get more description. So up ahead, these archers have barricaded the path with this shanty sort of wood barricade that doesn't even have a door in it. It's just a big messy blockade. And whoa, this is clearly a setup so that they can pepper you with arrows while you're struggling with the blockade. So to turn back, the bees. To go forward, the blockade and the archers. Now, how you give your players clues to deal with this is up to you. There's another crenellated cover area right here that an archer could use. You could undo their element advantage by getting some high ground if Helm were to climb up here with a climbing check, for example. Now it's an even archery contest. You could have the players take cover where they aren't even shootable. And that would just mean use line of sight to say like, whoa, we're gonna duck behind the rocks until we figure out something to do, or magic missile or whatever. So let this whole combat play out. Maybe Helm goes up and he decides to smash through this barricade. He's working through it. The barricade has something like 15 hit points. Helm is hitting it, bah, bah. it's got an armor class of 10, cha, cha, cha. He's breaking through it, good job. The archers get another round. Oh God, our hit points are getting low. He bashes through the barrier. The bees count down to two. They're getting very close now. They're starting to recoalesce. To make it more interesting, I have a giant wasp uh, pawn here on my hands. He joins the fray. Woo! The key lesson that they should be learning right now is if they just charge forward, these archers totally have the jump on them and stand to kill them all. So what you want to do is stop the caravan for a moment, force them to do something like this. Take cover behind this crenellation. Maybe Stills takes cover behind this little wooden piece here and Zymer stays completely concealed and they play out a ranged battle, which is a cover battle. Use disadvantage when things have cover or use advantage on the firer when they have high ground or they have cover and the target doesn't. You can mix up the dynamic using cover and high ground in a lot of different ways, but you don't have to get into complex bonuses and that's one of the joys of 5e. Just think about disadvantage and advantage for firers and targets and you can create a lot of dynamism that players can easily understand and use to their advantage. So, oh, they take down one of the archers, but oh crap, another one jumps out of the rocks to take his place. This one by a miracle is killed. Helm moves forward, and then we have some perception checks as they look around the space, wondering what's going on, and they see this cave entrance up here. Now, depending on how your battle goes, you're gonna know when the time comes. Your bees click down to one. Here they're getting close. When you feel the moment is right, and I wouldn't even put it on a timer, I would have Taldak emerge. So you can see this cave here. Taldak pops out. I'm using this uh, frog demon pawn. So it's like a giant bipedal frog monster. Jumps out of this cave. <laughs> Whoever's in view, so in this case we'll have Stills and Helm up here kind of engaging. Maybe they kill this archer. They need to roll charisma not to be shitting their pants. You can also use a wisdom save if you prefer for fear. Um, I kind of like charisma because people tend to neglect it as a stat. And especially in low fantasy, charisma can be a really powerful stat. So it's like, how much force of will do you have to be like, I'm not afraid of you, you stupid frog monster. Ah! So if they're terrified, they run back toward the bees. <laughs> if they're not, they can face him down. Zymer comes forward. The archery puzzle is solved. And more perception checks are going to be run, I guarantee you. If they can make a slightly more difficult perception check, or if they clear the perception check of 11 by a great deal, then give them some bonus information. On closer examination, Taldak is not a giant frog demon. No. In fact, he is just a troll with a frog demon costume on. So I'm using this frost troll pawn who kind of has like a sort of a weird hide on his back. And he reveals he's just, in, he's just in costume as this big frog demon. And when he's spotted for what he is, he absconds back into his cavern. At that moment, they might be dealing with the bees. They might be dealing with the archers. You don't know. And they have a great choice on their hands. Here's the bees advancing. The choice that they're faced with is, do we pursue Taldak into his lair and end his reign of terror forever? 
Or do we make our way out the exit of the map right here? And what are these? <laughs> so let's say that during the decision-making process, we have some perception checks. These pieces of stone right here are strangely sharp spikes of basalt that have formed out of the floor of the canyon. So sharp that if th something were to fall on them, it would be a really ugly situation. So they must be carefully circumnavigated. The other thing they notice, obviously, the cave entrance and footprints leading back and forth between the archery nest up here and the cave entrance. Now, if your players are true low fantasy players and have like one hit point right now, they might just run for their lives. They might just be, good riddance, Taldak, you faker. We're gonna tell everyone in town that you're just a guy in a costume. Let's go, guys. Uh, if they're more intrepid adventurers and if they're more like almost every adventurer I've ever played with, They'll conceal the wagon in some brush really quickly before the bees arrive, and they'll rush into the cavern to end Taldak forever. Assume that happens, which is a pretty safe assumption. You have on tap, right over here, the interior of Taldak's cave. Here's Taldak, right? You've got a little glowing bush to illuminate your interior of your cavern, and you take your characters, you put them right here as the entrance, and this is just a tiny little piece of foam terrain that serves as a very small interior. Here's Taldak. He plays kind of like a bugbear. You can battle him as a bugbear. The bees are out of the picture now. They don't follow into a cave. That's not a very bee-like uh, attitude. <laughs> Taldak has some nice treasure here. He's got a little bit of a loot box, maybe some uh, lumber and repair supplies that could be used on the wagon. He's defeated. Get a little bit of gold, get some XP. Hey, that was totally awesome. You pick a couple healing mushrooms right here. Great job, guys. Okay, you're done with that interior. They come back out, and if Taldak gets the best of them in the interior battle, they can bring him back out and use these sharp spikes as an environmental treat, right? So all they have to do is lure him across one, make him fall down, and ugh, he'll be skewered on them. That's if they're having trouble. Remember, these are like low-level characters dealing with a bugbear that you've probably tweaked a little bit to make him a little scarier and they might need to pull some tactics to defeat him rather than just tank and spank inside the cave. So that's why you have the sharp rock treat. If you need it, put one or two sharp rock treats inside the interior of Taldak's cave. That way they'll have that DPS assistance treat inside the interior and they can use that there too. Get this little, little bar barricade built back up here. So here's where your archers are gonna live with this nice cover and nice location. So what have the PCs learned here. They've learned that they can kick ass. So I had, what, five more archers on tap. So if that archery battle really sets in and really has a great fun tone, I'm gonna keep spawning archers and keep it fun because these archers have like five hit points. So they're gonna get killed. They're just gonna teach cover. They're gonna teach high ground. But it's really fun to dispatch lots of small enemies rather than slowly dispatching one huge enemy. That's more of a mid to high level behavior. Low-level characters are going to have lots of fun just eliminating low-level monsters. They're each worth like 100 XP, right? No big deal. Um, then, of course, I also have Taldak in his two forms. Frog demon form and then revealed sort of costume form. What's the purpose of even doing that? Why bother? This sets me up in the future to be able to spring monsters and creatures on these characters that aren't just out-of-the-book, cartoony, you know, classic fantasy monsters. I've established that in my world, things may not be as fantastical as they seem, and it's gonna give me lots of flexibility in the future, working this group down and down and down back to the mortal level of adventure. And so when they hear about a dragon in a town, they might be like, is it really a dragon? Or is it like a guy with a wagon that's got some like paper mache dragon stuff like at night and there was some fire and you couldn't really see like, I mean, dragons aren't real, man, right? You wanna bring that into question. That's classic low fantasy. Just like Gandalf said, their dragon hasn't been seen in these parts for a thousand years, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. I'm not sure why he said that because he was just battling smog only 60 years earlier, but we'll look past that for a moment. Okay, so they get the wagon out of the detour, they find their way back to the road, and they're making their way back toward Westburg. No big deal, right? But that's your board. It's got a lot of simplicity. It teaches some basic combat. There's a tiny bit of role playing if they want to capture an archer, if they want to capture Taldak, if they want to negotiate in any way, they probably could. They could intimidate, they could trick, they could go stealth. There's a lot that can be done with such simple 
enemies that don't ask a lot of complexity. There's no intrigue here. These enemies pretty much just want to loot the corpses of the players. No big deal. So there you go. It's a bugbear in the mountains is pretty much all that adds up to. <laughs> and just your normal, you may notice, hey man, this looks like the same tile set from Road to Westburg, right? This is just bushes and gray rocks again. You're losing your, you're losing your edge, Hanker and Fernell. Remember, low fantasy is for beginning DMs, so I'm gonna assume all you have is some bushes and some gray rocks. So you wanna be able to create a lot of different encounters with that basic kit. The other fun one is bringing the interior board out that's smaller, it's a quick boop, 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 boop. You know, it's not like every interior has to be a maze. If you want it to be a maze because you got more time in your night, Great, rock on. That's it, that's the Deadly Detour, one of my simplest room designs I've ever done. And probably the conclusion of pursuing the low fantasy room sequence because I think I'm gonna put all my work into the Moloch campaign. It's uh, definitely earned the most response on the channel, so thanks everybody for all the messages and stuff. Really appreciate it. That's it for this little video. I'm gonna get the hell out of here and uh, get back to my book. Mm. Ah. Nothing like a little stacking hay IPA. Don't forget the close-ups.